Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Um, we never met at like when I was like kind of occasionally on MSNBC shows, right? Uh, it's hard for me to say for sure. I know. But... Every like <laughs> so. every like white guy pundit blended uh, very uh, easily in the backstage. Like that, but like you can't remember. I in my mind anyway, I can't remember who I actually met and who I just like saw on TV. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I only have one memory, and I remember I was on Melissa's show with Bill Nye, and I remember him shoveling backstage snacks into his bag, and that is seared into my memory forever, <laughs> literally forever. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I have so much I want to talk to you about. Um, the first thing is, I finally started watching your new show, um, and I love it. And I think the thing I love the most about it is that when you look at the set, um, it's so professional that it almost looks like a like Good Morning America happy set. Like you know, up next, it's like the cast of Glee or whatever. <laughs> And then you listen to your monologues and you're like, here's how we're going to take down the military industrial complex. And it's, <laughs> it's just wonderful. Uh, how did that happen? Yeah, that's that you picked right up on what we also love about our show because <laughs> it just, we have this like happy music, mm -hmm. right? Like coming in and it's, it looks very sort of morning show, yes, cable yes. news or whatever. Or you should all be drinking wine. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, and like selling vacuum cleaners or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, and but as you point out, we sound a little different than mm -hmm. the normal take. Um, you know, it's kind of I mean, it's kind of was a happy accident. Uh, you know, Sagar and I happen to be put together. Um, this show started with a different host who I also really liked. Um, and he left to, to focus more on his radio show. And so Sagar came in and I'm on the left, he's on the right, but yeah. we both have this sort of, um, you know, populist framing and focus on the working class here and worldwide. And it's very anti-establishment view, um, this sort of disgust and frustration with a lot of the elite media. So in a lot of ways, our analysis of the problem is the same, even though where we would take that in terms of solutions is different. So it created this interesting dynamic politically. And then... Yeah, we, you know, this was just like the way the show was set up was to be look and feel kind of like, you know, we're coming from the hill and we're here in D.C. and a traditional type show. Yeah, it just, well, it's our politics are not traditional. Well, it's great because it makes it digestible. You know what I mean? Like when you have when like every left wing show is just like we're coming live from a bunker, uh, you know, uh, it's hard for people to jump on board. Or I remember there was a phase so many people are talking about uh, like RT, Russia TV, like it's legitimately like hosted by Putin. But there was a phase like I've been on that show that, or on that station. There was a phase like 10 years ago where pretty much every left wing pundit at some point like did something on that station. But that was it was like that and Al Jazeera were where like all the lefties were going. And to people who don't know uh, a, a lot or they hear Al Jazeera and they're like, that sounds terroristy. And Russia Today, that sounds terroristy. That was kind of the place where lefties uh, went. So it's nice. I think it's important to have like comedy and shows that, 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 that look like yours and stuff that sort of is more welcoming uh, aesthetically, as stupid as that sounds, just to get people to listen. Because once people listen, because you were saying you have people from the right and the left, once they listen, they go, oh, that makes more sense. It's just like sneaking in the door that's the hard part. No, I think there's something to that. And look, I like present as your sort of typical anchor woman, you know, and I wear the like, you know, single color jewel tone sheet or whatever. <laughs> right, right, right. So, right. I mean, it, it, there is something to that. I also would say, on the right, there is this funnel from the sort of YouTube creators and the independent creators and whatever you think of them. There's there's a funnel from them into the mainstream. So there's connectivity. Right. On the right. left, that really doesn't exist. Yeah. So part of what I you know see as important is kind of building that bridge out. And I also look, we have on our show, we have on members of Congress, we have on mainstream officials, and then we ask them questions that maybe they aren't getting asked. Um, by the rest of the media and end up making news with them. And, and I find that part of it really exciting too. Yeah. I've interviewed Rudy Giuliani, right? We've interviewed Ted Lieu. Like we, 
we also are interviewing these newsmakers, but doing it in a somewhat different way and getting different things out of them too. Okay, this is incredible because I I didn't know that your co-host was um, was on the right, and what you said sort of solidified my hypothesis about normal people, not just like Twitter people, because there's this thing that I get it from the left the most, and I want to ask you about it, but so that's kind of the premise of this show too. I'm still very liberal, um, but what I've noticed is the people who will get the most upset with the show are more centrist Democrats, and Mm -hmm. I straight up have people who are like, found you on Glenn Beck, here's like $50 a month, and they're more open to kind of hearing a lot of things which they straight up disagree with, and there's this term on the left now, which is like grifter, where if you are seen as interviewing right wing people or, um, you know, ha- having conservative listeners or whatever, you're somehow trying to play this gross sort of center, uh, you know, don't really have any opinions like both sides are kind of right. And right. I think in reality, what there is, is what you were saying, which is there's a lot of people who, even if they disagree on policies, they know they're being fucked over by the media. They know they're being fucked over by Washington. Uh, They're struggling and they're hurting. Uh, This is affecting both people on the left and the right. Well, here's the way I think about it, right? 70% of Americans tell pollsters that they are furious with the political establishment. 70%, right? So- it's not like our view is representing some fringe view. Right. We are representing a massive mainstream that is basically wholly unrepresented in elite media. So that's the way that's the way that I look at it. And no, I, I don't think we should be afraid to engage with the best of the arguments on the other side. And that's always my view, right? Look, there are some people who come in bad faith and they're just propagandists and like, why waste your time with them? Right. The way I think about this, though, is is number one, if, if someone's offering a, a well thought out argument in good faith, I am 100 percent willing to engage with them on that. If they're a person who may not be offering those arguments in, in good faith, but who have power, whether we want them to have power or not, if they yeah. have power, like they don't need me to legitimize them. They already have that legitimacy. So they should be engaged with and challenged too. So, you know, I, I for me, I guess I have a little bit of a different view than some on the left about who's worthy of engagement or this idea of legitimizing someone. A lot of these people are already legitimized, already have a following, and you can't just bury your head in the sand about that. Right, and you can also, I mean, I remember I did this right-wing show and I was the only liberal on the panel. And instead of just going in there and flipping over the table and being like, y'all have blood on your hands. We were talking about immigration and I remember I kind of just like stepped back and was like, Look, I know you guys like have kids like you don't actually want kids in cages. Right. And all of them were like, no, of course we don't. And they started kind of giving their points of view, but not in like a talking point aggressive way anymore. They started being like, how do we get these kids out of cages? And that was such an important moment for me because I used to be very divisive. I used to be uh You know, I mean, just like as if you didn't agree with me, you know, Nazi, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that was such an interesting moment for me because you realize that on Twitter, you're sort of forcing people to be their worst selves. Mm. And what I mean by that is like now that I follow some right wing people, I've seen right wing people after a mass shooting be like, oh my God, we have to do something about, I literally saw someone from Glenn Beck's network go, we have to do something about white supremacy. And I was like, what the fuck? Like you guys talk about white supremacy? <laughs> and I and I was so shocked and it's so insulting just to think that like, you know, everyone on the right, every time there's a massacre, they're like, woo, and like shooting their guns in the air. It's like, no, of course the good people on that side want to change. But when you don't give them a a, a a space to say that without yeah. just saying you're a monster, you uh, support these shootings, you're a Nazi or whatever, then what happens is they go, well, fuck you guys. And then they're going to stay silent when Trump does something horrible or stay right. silent when there's a shooting. Right. No, that's right. I mean, and it's, it's not just political leaders either. It's the way that um, the Trump voter has been treated by um, a lot of mainstream Democrats and the elite media. I actually did a thing on this today. It is very convenient 
for all white working class Trump voters to just be dismissed as like brainwashed, build that wall, racist. Right. Right. It's very convenient to because that keeps you as the media from having to ask hard questions about the way that right. you've covered issues and what you focus it's very convenient for the democratic establishment because it keeps them from having to ask hard questions about like how did it end up that the the white working class would go over to the traditional party of the plutocrats to support this like billionaire clown like right. what did, where did we go wrong right if they can put it all on the racist dumb lazy voter they don't have to ask those hard questions so there was a, a piece in in the times it's just a little piece but i found it really funny about how they were shocked to hear that Andrew Yang had this friend. Remember in the debate, they asked everybody who their surprising friend oh, was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so bad. So Yang said, I'm friends with this trucker named Fred, who's a former Trump supporter, and now we're friends. And the Times was like mind blown by this, right? <laughs> because it didn't fit. I mean, that, you know, that a white working class person would support Andrew Yang, yeah. who's like, I mean, this Fred's, Asian pr- guy. Fred's probably a Russian asset, if we're being honest. Right, obviously, right? <laughs> so, so they went out in search of Fred. And actually, Fred, who noted their um, so, skeptical debate coverage, yeah. reached out to them to be like, yo, I, you know, I'm here, I exist, if you want to know what my thoughts are on this. And he just said very simply, Andrew's talking about things that, that concern me, right? Yeah. Like, he, he sees me and he cares about what's going on in my life. Like, so simple. But I thought it was very telling because it exposed – how stereotyped they'd made this group of people in their minds and in their coverage. And it also blew up this idea that is has been really pushed hard this week, that the way to win back these swing Trump voters is through a moderate like Klobuchar or Pete Buttigieg. Right. When the very idea that what the white working class Obama Trump voter really wanted was moderation, right. like that's just <laughs> on its face. Completely insane, right? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, like when you see a picture of Donald Trump, you don't go, that's nuance right there. That's what that guy is. Moderation. That's what these voters are looking for. Holy shit. Keep Buttigieg all the way. I mean, it's just like, so they were faced with that and had to grapple with it at least for a moment. Um, But I think, again, it just shows you how sort of, look, the media caters to, this is Noam Chomsky, manufacturing consent. This is not my original idea. But they are selling products, whether it's new subscriptions or whether it's whatever consumer goods their advertisers are selling. They're selling products at the end of the day. And so, of course, they want an affluent, you know, mostly it ends up being white, liberal, affluent base. And so that's who they are catering to. And as soon as you see it through that lens of like, that's their consumer, that's yeah. their audience, the whole thing makes a lot more sense. Why they'd be pushing Pete Buttigieg or Amy Klamashar, totally dismissing, dismissing Bernie Sanders or Andrew Yang. Right. Well, I mean, I remember during probably like Carrie Bush, um, I interviewed Nader and Chomsky, and we talked about this, and Nader gave this like really... I'm really going hipster. It's like people were so mad about Jill Stein. I was like, oh, people were mad at me for Ralph Nader, kids. Uh, (laughs) And I interviewed him, and he gave this really kind of heartbreaking, impassioned plea where he goes, people call us radical. And I think about this now with Bernie or whatever. He goes, people call us radical. And he's like, there's nothing radical about wanting people to have health care. There's nothing radical about wanting people to have an education. There's nothing radical about not wanting to send children over to die in wars we shouldn't be fighting. If you look issue per issue, and this is when Democrats were giving him infinitely more shit than conservatives, issue by issue, the majority of Americans, you know, want out of these endless wars, you know, want the banks held uh, accountable. I mean, shit, every conservative that writes in or I talk to on the show, they're like, oh, yeah, what happened with Wall Street is ridiculous. And they're just as mad um, because, again, it was and this is a Nader quote, but it was we had socialism uh, for the banks. We had socialism for these corporations. Um, and so it's so interesting. And, and that's where. I start to think, oh, we don't actually care about, or at least the Democratic establishment, like, do you actually care about these policies and these principles, or um, are you just trying to get your team elected and trying to kind of keep the status quo alive? Well, what's funny is in that obsession with, sorry, guys, you may want real change, but we got to get elected. Like they've done yeah. nothing basically but lose. Right. Right. Like, right. In that un- unending quest-, quest to win above all else, they've just basically lost. So, yeah, it's not even know, working. Even at that level, it doesn't make any sense. And 
I think there's two things. I think Democrats of a certain age were so scarred by that, like, wandering in the desert before Bill Clinton came and rescued them. Right. But that, like, conventional wisdom of the way to win is triangulate, counter schedule your own base, like, end welfare, pass NAFTA, suck up to the corporations. That's so ingrained, even though. When Clinton ran the first time, he actually ran as a populist. He didn't run as this, like, you know, triangulating, move to the center dude that we've come to know. But anyway, that was the lesson that was taken. And it and not only is it basically immune to any sort of facts or data, because it's a, a view of the world that makes sense to the media, like the people who do vote that way and do think that way are surrounding, you know, yeah. are the media and are surrounding the media. So it's that, but then you also have in the Democratic establishment side, like the leaders came into power through this way of doing politics. So they own, they owe their own power and influence to this particular model of politics. So you change the model of politics, you change the power structure, and that's bad for them. And you can see it with AOC and Pelosi, right. right? There's a reason why there's so much friction there because AOC comes in with a very different theory of the case. I'm going to work the outside game, right? I'm going to bring in the activists. I'm going to sit outside of your your office, Speaker Pelosi, before, you know, right when I'm sworn in, that's the model. And, and you see how much influence she has and how that's a direct threat to the people who are in power in the way that they've been doing business. Yeah. Do you think that activist base is, I talked about this on yesterday's show, where I saw a friend of mine, a comedian, actually, um, this kid, Matt Lieb, he posted that that's one of the differences between Bernie and Warren is Bernie has such a huge activist base that it will actually keep him um keep him honest if he becomes elected like i remember uh i interviewed this guy eugene jarecki it was like one of my first interviews like forever ago and i think the name of his documentary was uh like the american way of war it was the big documentary about the military industrial complex like the first one and he was talking about if obama gets elected What's more important than electing him is we need uh, activists every day uh, outside the White House holding him accountable, holding him accountable for health care, holding him accountable for gay rights and so on. And I think that's something that we kind of lost under Obama, uh, where everyone was so excited um, when he won. And then they were like, all right, cool. Like, you got it. Like, bye. And then Good. they left. Yeah, um, we got Larry Summers. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, you know, I mean, the first decision was, you know, Rick Warren, this like homophobe, like was the guy who was like spoke at the inauguration and it, it just started going downhill from there. Uh, how important is that activist base? Uh, and, and, and do you think that there is um, more of a chance of sort of staying progressive with someone like Bernie compared to Elizabeth Warren or, you know, obviously the other yeah. candidates. Yeah. I mean, look, whatever you think of Bernie Sanders, whether this is a positive or negative, he's not going to be changed. Right. He is who <laughs> he is. And it's a very unusual person. And AOC talked about this in her endorsement of him, right? The pressure that comes on you when you're in Washington, when you're breaking bread with your fellow caucus members, and it's all about being part of the team. And yeah. you have to look at these people in the eye when, you know, face to face and all, just all those pressures that come to bear on you. It's a very unusual person to be Bernie Sanders and be in that and still stand outside of it and still like speak truth to power in the way that he has over many years. So I think he's definitely proven that. And then you look at the coalition he has, and this is something we talk a lot about on, on my show rising with um, that Sagar and I talk about. If you're just looking at the Warren coalition and the Sanders coalition, they are in fact very different. Sanders top contributors are like, wait staff and Walmart workers and Amazon workers and teachers yeah. and truck drivers. It's like right? the, the hemp industrial complex. It's like right. It's not. <laughs> and, right. And then Warren's top contributors, and this is very unique, are like um, librarians, huh. economists, professors, um, researchers. So this sort of like managerial and um, intellectual class. And then Buttigieg, Kamala, Biden, all those people are like executives, presidents of companies, et cetera. Right. But I, I actually think that says everything because personally for me, you know, I think the Democratic Party really went astray when they stopped being centered around the multiracial working class and instead made this intentional shift during the Clinton years to capture the rising like 
white collar professional managerial class. And so what that's translated into is the, that white collar professional managerial class is really the center of the focus, right? The party is really designed for them. And then there's enough sort of anti-racism and identity signaling to make sure that the black and brown working class don't go over to the Republicans who are blatantly racist. But nothing is really done to better people's material interests, right? Yeah. If you actually have the working class at the center of what you're doing, the multiracial working class, then it really changes what the party's priorities are and what they go to the map for. So to me, that realignment occurring is the most important thing that could happen in the Democratic Party. And the only really two candidates who show any signs of being able to pull that off are Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, and anytime Kamala Harris does, you're like, this is a trap and you're going to lure us in and arrest us. Uh, <laughs> what I'm going to stutter my way through this question because okay. it's usually asked so terribly. Um, but when you said multi uh, multiracial working class, I thought that was really interesting. And I actually haven't heard that term a lot um, because I feel like there's two camps. There's, you know, where I used to be the sort of like woke every movie is problematic like if you're happy like i'm gonna find an old tweet of yours blah 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 but then there's the camp that goes so hard to rebel against that because they're tired of cancel culture they're tired of blah uh, of whatever that they end up sounding whether they're on the left or the right straight up like bigots yeah and uh, you know whenever people i feel like are asked about woke culture or sjw or whatever term they're using it it's not asked in a well-intentioned way. You know, it's kind of like the left lost because trans people want to use bathrooms. And it's like, all right, well, that's not exactly what happened. But I'm I'm curious your take <laughs> because I feel like you're, you're in this uh, unique space. <laughs> what is your, what's the middle ground, right? Where is identity politics very <laughs> important because obviously like, minorities and black people i still have that like tickle in my throat oh it's the worst yeah anytime you have to get up just straight up get up i started laughing at the idea of the second i was like <laughs> brought up identity politics you fake a cough fit and then like yeah. i just hear the door close and a car start <laughs> that's it <laughs> so, so what um Okay, so with identity politics, so the way to talk about in the middle, right, is like you should be able to say that uh, minorities, LGBT, women, uh, black people, people of color, blah, 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 um, that there are issues that we have to struggle with, right? That there is still institutional right. racism, uh, et cetera. But where are – where is the left kind of going astray um, in your opinion – where is it that we're putting that too much at the forefront? Is it that um, maybe the issues are, are too esoteric and it's just kind of uh, highly educated white people on Twitter who are like, oh, you were offended by this? Well, I was offended by, you know, their early stuff. Or, and it sounds very hipstery. Um, yeah. Or is it just the fact that, and this is the part that starts to sound problematic, where it's just like, People in the Midwest who are jobless and don't have a bunch of kids, like, don't give a shit about that stuff. How do we still not throw minorities under the bus um, while also uh, not driving away a lot of the kind of poorer working class that may just not know a lot about these issues? Right, right. Um, you know, I wrote the day after... Uh, 2016 and a piece that kind of went viral that was called the Democratic Party deserved to die. Right. <laughs> Said basically <laughs> so in typical trademark understated fashion. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote that, you know, the dis dispatches were coming back from the industrial Midwest. I mean, people are literally killing themselves, like killing themselves, killing themselves or killing themselves through drugs or alcohol or whatever. Like, it's an ugly scene yeah. for all of the working class and the white working class. And basically the response from the democratic party was shut up with your white privilege. Right? right. And so that, that mode of contempt, I mean, it's really not complicated. No one's going to vote for a party that has contempt for them. Right. And that's what we've had. Right. So 
I see this, I lived in Kentucky during the 2016 election and, you know, there's, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to focus on there. They're ground zero for the opioid crisis, you know, as one, there's been massive job loss. There's been massive deindustrialization. Like it's there, there are real problems. Right. And so when I would write about these things, I'd get a lot back after the election of like, well, fuck those people. They voted for Trump. They get what they deserve. Right. Which I'm sure you've seen too. And a hundred percent. To me, I just, you know, I never signed up to be part of a group of people that like picks and chooses who's worthy of sympathy, who's worthy of humanity, right? Whether or not they hold like perfectly PC views on on everything that I want them to. So that's the one piece. I'll tell you where I get uncomfortable in the identity politics place on all of the issues that you talked about, trans rights, like I am 110% there, right? All the way there. And I think it's important. I don't think it's a side issue. I don't think it's something that should be dismissed. But where I get uncomfortable, and I'll use a very specific example, is you know Kamala Harris walks out to the CNN LGBTQ town hall, and yep. she, she sits down and she says, my pronouns are she, hers, right? Look, great, fine. But what that's used as in her case and with a lot of corporate America is to basically signal that they're liberal without actually delivering on the economic front. Right. So it's like I can signal culturally that I'm with you while, you know, in Kamala Harris's case, failing to prosecute the banks that were screwing over homeowners when she was AG of California. Right. Or like, you know, Hillary Clinton. Same thing. Right. I can I can show you that I'm woke, that I'm with you, that like I'm there with you on these cultural issues while I'm also giving speeches to Goldman Sachs and like taking 15 million dollars into my family foundation from Saudi Arabia, et cetera. Right. And and, and, that's where I get that's where I have a problem is when it collapses to only the identity issue, because black and brown people are so much more than just like, you know, just their their race, like. They have the same complex needs as everybody. Right. Yeah. Like trans people, (laughs) if trans people aren't being employed, they're not going to give a shit that Kamala Harris for one time in her life. You know, it's not like she always now will identify herself (laughs) that we're not going to see her at the next debate or we didn't see her at the next debate. Uh, You know, say my pronouns are, you know, whatever. It's like, no, you're clearly doing that to pander. (laughs) And on the left, we're so, uh, easily manipulated that we just clap for that and we go oh i guess she's uh, a a good one because she didn't say her pronouns were like you know the narc and cop or whatever (laughs) and it's that's a really good way to put it and i've i've never heard it put that way where not only are you alienating people but you're also giving yourself cover for when you fuck over the same people whose ass you're kissing disingenuously right now. Right. Well, look at the last election. Black and brown people did not show up in the numbers that Hillary Clinton needed them to, even though she did all of the woke signaling, yep. you know, all of the identity issue signaling that she was supposed to do, but she didn't have say anything to them that made sense in terms of bread and butter issues. Well, and this is a problem so when it's, it's not a, it, you can't compensate, right? It's not, it doesn't cover that. And that's when I, when I talk about the, the party being centered around the professional managerial class, like they're good with the, these identity issues because anti-racism, all these things, which are very important, like doesn't affect their, doesn't affect their taxes, right? right. Doesn't change right. their comfortable spot in the meritocracy, et cetera. When you actually start changing, talking about changing who holds power, that's when things start to get uncomfortable, right? Yeah. It was really interesting. Um, you know, now that I've become friends with some more conservatives, reading people that, um, reading people that I would have never read before. Like I read this piece by Andrew Sullivan and uh, you know, my side were like, Andrew Sullivan's the gay Republican asshole. Like that's all we knew about the guy. Like I never read him. (laughs) I just yelled about him. And I read this article and it was the first time that I read that the majority of the sort of woke left are actually rich, highly educated white people. And then I thought about like when I lived in Park Slope, Brooklyn and would have our like, you know, journalist drinking night with like everyone from the nation. It's like there's a lot of 
there's a lot of white people. Um, and a lot of times it's sort of white people projecting uh, their white guilt while uh, the people of color are, are, are still being fucked over. I, 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 I want to go back to your Kentucky point because I've talked about this a lot on the show um, and I'm curious uh, as a lady, as someone who's probably dealt with like creepy guys, um, the demonization of men as well, because when you brought up the, the contempt issue, one of the things I've been talking about is, look, I will never be one of those people that's like, if you don't, men have it as hard as women, right? There are different problems on both sides. Yeah. Um, but when you brought up suicide, that was a really interesting point because I remember when I started listening to, let's take the most controversial uh, uh, example, which is like Jordan Peterson, right? Yeah. The first Jordan Peterson video I ever watched, I legitimately thought it was going to be him like in a clan outfit. Like just from what I heard about Jordan <laughs> Peterson, I was like, oh, here we go. And yeah. it, it wasn't a political video that I watched. It was a whole video about uh, bettering yourself. And it was geared towards young men. And it was saying stuff that was pretty simple, right? It was it was walk confidently, walk with your shoulders back, uh, your back straight, uh, make your bed in the morning, uh, uh, take responsibility. All of these things that I'm embarrassed to say, but as a 37-year-old, I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I got to make my bed. And like, <laughs> it really uh, spoke to me. And I realized that the reason it spoke to me was when I was on the super, super left or whatever, I didn't have a lot of male role models. Um, I didn't have a lot of male role models, at, at least in like the masculine sense, right? Um, yeah. Talking about, until I started doing MMA a lot. And it was the first time that like a coach didn't care about PC language. And he was like, stop being a bitch, get up. And I was like, oh, right, I got to get up. Um, but in my head, I'm like, you're not allowed to use that word. But I was like, I got to get up. And it, and by the way, these guys were like, still like really liberal guys. They were just like dudes. They were probably a lot of the dudes you talk to in Kentucky. And... The problem is when there aren't masculine role models on the left, in my opinion, is when you go to the Jordan Peterson make your bed video on YouTube, which you brought up YouTube earlier, then YouTube goes, cool, if you like Jordan Peterson make the bed, you'll love Ben Shapiro ship trans people to Mexico or whatever. <laughs> and it goes down this rabbit hole. And so what I'm finding is we are doing the not only are we we're pushing people away. Um, yeah. And that doesn't mean, look, let's kiss up to bigots or let's, you know, let Jordan Peterson say stuff about trans people that maybe we disagree with. But it's also if there are a bunch of young men and they're confused and they're depressed and they're poor and they're looking towards drugs. And the only people who are inspiring that uh, sort of testosterone fueled part of them are dudes on the right, are these Navy SEALs are, you know, stuff like that. They're going to end up over there. Right. Yeah. No, I think it's, there's a, it's, it's actually a very deep question that, you know, I'm, I'm still grappling with honestly what this looks like, but, you know, essentially the democratic party has adopted the same view of the sort of American dream and ideal of the American meritocracy as the right, right? If we just but on the right, they're like, it's already perfect and everyone can ascend to their rightful place in the meritocracy and it's all good. And on the left, we said, well, no, that's the goal. But, you know, racism stands in the way, um, genderism stands in the way, like ageism, like these, you know, bigotry stands in the way. So we're going to focus on removing those barriers so that everyone can ascend to their rightful place in the meritocracy. So if you're a little Barack Obama, and you're a genius and you should be president of the United States if you're a little, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and you yeah. deserve to be a multi, multi billionaire, right? We're gonna make sure that that path is open to you. And the problem with that analysis is that if you are a white man, Democrats had no explanation for why you may not be succeeding in that system, right? Because it should be perfect for you, right? right? You're a white man. You're not being discriminated against. You're if you're straight, like right, you right. should be good to go. What are you complaining about? And so we literally had nothing to say to a group of people, some of whom are doing fantastically well, and some of whom, like all groups of people, are struggling and aren't making it in the American stupid capitalist system and aren't finding worth and meaning and don't think that they have hope for themselves or you know, they're having trouble like having the money to have a family or 
being able to achieve the, the level of um, economic security that their dad or their grandfather was or have that kind of pride of work that their dad or their grandfather was. We had literally nothing to say to that group. And so I think there's a bigger sort of philosophical realignment that has to come in the Democratic Party of saying, no, it's not about, oh, you happen to be born with these you know, lucky skills and talents, so you deserve to be a billionaire and you happen not to be born with those things so you deserve to basically like starve and die. We have to really transform to say, no, if you are, if you're American, if you're a human being, you deserve a basic level of worth and dignity. And if that's not happening for you, it's not your fault. And that's the thing is like, we put the fault on the young man who wasn't succeeding in this stupid, terrible system that we have in the country. We put the thought fault on them and said, it must be your fault right. because you're not faced with racism. You're not faced with sexism. You're not faced with, you know, with LGBTQ discrimination. Like it must be your fault. And I think that's a big part of where we went awry and left this huge opening for the right to come in and say, no, no, we've got you. We've yeah. got you. And we can use masculinity, like just with the, the, the gender issue to, inspire the left as well if you want to go look you're a guy we recognize that you know cis men are are different than women like go train hard go be tough like eat a fucking steak all that stuff but then what's an incredibly masculine trait is to defend people who need defending which means uh and that aligns with a lot of like liberal policies right um so instead of just saying like you're not welcome here you're part of the problem like there's a way to 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 harness that and 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 then to bring it back to the election is when you have a corporate democrat like clinton not only do these people feel alienated but then like a lot of the stuff trump said about Goldman Sachs, about the corporate media. He was right. That echoed the same interview I did with Ralph Nader, who was saying the same things. So when we present a candidate that, now what Trump didn't say is, I am also doing the same thing. I am also friends with these same people. Um, but to me, that showed that, wow, an actual progressive has a much better chance of winning an election than a corporate Democrat because you can't look at Bernie and say he was giving speeches to Goldman Sachs. The only time I would believe Bernie is in Goldman Sachs is if he like snuck in to like burn the place down like right. with like his hospital IV like still like dragging behind him. Um, so if you present a candidate, but it's also like it's kind of hopeful, right? It's sort of hopeful that people who voted for Trump are sick of corporate media and are sick of Goldman Sachs. Look, it's an opening. It really is an opening. And it could go in a really, really, really bad direction. And it could actually be the thing that kind of like broke the system open to make things possible that weren't possible before. Right. Right. I really think that's true. And you can see it reflected in the Democratic Party debate right now. I mean, we're debating ideas that were not on the table four years ago at all. Right. right? right. Things that were like Bernie Sanders, oh my God, nobody would ever. Now that's just like the mainstream of the party. And that's an incredible thing and an incredible opportunity. But yeah, look, Biden's perfect example. You know, the thing Trump did in Ukraine and the quid pro, like that's illegal, it sucks, it's terrible. But how well are we going to be able to make that case when you're like, yeah, but your son was sitting on that board making 50K a month, like, right. and you're running as the moralist. Right. Right. He's not running as a moralist. He's not pretending that he's following these rules. He came in explicitly on a promise to basically break all the rules. And he's following through on that promise. Yeah. No doubt about it. So it, it doesn't work to be the Joe Biden. We're going to return to the values when your values are also suspect and your values are basically why we have Donald Trump. Yeah. Are you. Uh... I, I want to end with everything that happened this week with the media uh, uh, and, you know, Tulsi and Bernie. Um, but th this might sound like a kind of like Ellen dancing with George Bush question, but yeah. it, it, it's <laughs> it's a sincere question. Um, have you, especially because we have a lot of conservatives that listen to the show now, um, have you changed your mind or have you become more 
center or uh, uh, has there has has there been any shift um, since co-hosting the show with someone on the right or talking from fans who are on the right um, who again is not like a disingenuous like evil conservative but someone who just differs in your point of view or do you still have pretty much the same values but you just maybe communicate them differently I think the values are more or less the same. I mean, look, I, you know, grew up in actual like Trump country, Virginia, lived in Kentucky. My personal political formation really happened living in an industrial Midwestern town that had been devastated. First, it was the pottery capital of the world. All the dishes and plates were made there. That went overseas in the 50s. Then there was a steel mill next door. Everybody worked at the steel mill. That went away in the 80s. And now this place is just devastated. And if you go up and down the Ohio River, it's the same thing. And that was really my political formation of like, it wasn't, oh, Republicans are bad and did this. It was like, oh, these people got fucked by everyone, right? right? And Barack Obama was called some like truth teller that he was willing to go there and tell them they were screwed. Like that's like that's right. a brave thing to do, you know, like congratulations, you're screwed. Sorry, I'm not doing anything for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what a hero. Oh, just told the truth, the hard truth. He landed yeah. in Kentucky, was like, this place sucks, and left, and everyone was like, yay. Yeah, hard truth, buddy. Way to go. <laughs> so that was really my sort of political awakening. So I'm, I, I've am i never, the only times in my life when I've had been in that bubble, truly where it's just surrounded by other sort of liberal elites, was the time period at, at MSNBC. Um, yeah, really, that's it. So I think I've always tried to keep touch with other perspectives and, you know, and have that in mind. Now, I I would say I think the Trump era has been a sort of clarifying and certainly certain ways radicalizing time for for myself and, and for others. But the core view that, you know, I'm not on team Democrat. I'm on team like working class. Yeah. Um, yeah. Has been there for for quite a long time. That's awesome. Yeah, it's so crazy to even use the word radicalize because it's like, that sounds like we're terrorists. Uh, <laughs> but it's true. Where, And I think that under Trump, you can be radicalized to just turn into a lunatic and everyone that disagrees or could cost you the election as a Russian asset or whatever. Right. Or you could be radicalized in the truest sense, which is realizing that like, oh, something has gone terribly wrong. And right. that not only means that we have to call out Trump, but it, what it really, really means is that we have to be honest with ourselves, that we have to form coalitions. And yeah, I mean, maybe that is why you can do it, because you didn't grow up in like the uh, MSNBC bubble and you actually grew up around these people who, you know, like aren't all like Nazis. Horrible, racist Nazis. I mean, look, I was just looking at a graphic before we started talking about all the places around the world where that have seen massive protests and uprisings over the past month. And it's like 20 different countries around the world right now. There's Lebanon and Chile are just like blowing up and it's all this basically frustration with elites and corruption and economic misery. And there is a working class uprising happening around the globe And yet what the media mostly focuses on is these little like daily skirmishes in Trump's Twitter feed. Right. Right. So that's the sense that I mean, I've been radicalized is rather than thinking that the the show that's put on by the media, these like intramural skirmishes are really the story that there's a much bigger, deeper rot that needs to be focused on and dealt with that's happening here and it's happening around the world. Yeah. And it's also, um, we're so tribalized that, I mean, I remember when I watched that Jordan Peterson video and when I started like being like, Ugh, at like some of the stuff I used to do being like, does that mean I have to be a conservative now? And even just talking to you about being like, no, 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 I'm for the working class. I'm just not for everything that like everyone on the left is doing is so important because I think there are a lot of conservatives that align with you more than Donald Trump and they just don't know it. Or there are a lot of liberals like me who are almost like, do I just leave and like not care about politics because they don't feel welcome? So to kind of hear these conversations like with what you're doing on your show now, I think is like really important. And I think that it's, it's, 
it's not the most popular thing to do right now, right? Like, especially for me in entertainment, when I told my agent, like, you know, look, I was always the political guy. Like, I'm not allowed on Conan, be back on Conan, because I used my stand-up set to talk about drones in the Obama administration. Like, in my comedy set, Crystal. Um, and so, like, I was always, like, that guy. And now that it's popular to be that guy, you know, when I told my agent, like, hey, I want to do a podcast about, like, nuance and coming together, he was just like, oh, fuck. But, like, that can still be a radical thing. I mean, it kind of is like what you're doing in a way is like more radical than a lot of these self-proclaimed radicals. Well, and and like I said, I, just keep in mind, 70 percent of America agrees that the political establishment is fucked. Right. So like right. that 70 percent may not always be the most represented on Twitter or whatever or the loudest voices on Twitter. But that is the real undercurrent in America. So there's a massive group of people out there who want to see people who are willing to listen to both sides and willing to call bullshit on both sides. Yeah. Right. And that's what we, that's what we really try, you know, not claiming to be perfect, not saying we live up to that every day, but that's really the project we're trying to work on. Um, as someone who was on MSNBC, which is known as like the liberal Fox news, which I completely disagree with. Um, but who was on MSNBC, what do you see as the difference now with your, the freedom you have um, being more independent it, it, is, is there a lot of it? Uh, like I not saying you were being like censored at MSNBC, but do you feel like now you can speak more openly when it comes to like mm -hmm. corporate power and, and issues like that? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely feel, and I, and I would never, I would never go back to, you know, having to operate in that kind of structure. I just, I just wouldn't, you know, I'd rather go out on my own and, and do my own independent thing than have to censor what I'm saying. I mean, listen, like people around the world get literally imprisoned and murdered for expressing unpopular political views. Right. 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 If the worst I have to worry about is like, oh, my career trajectory, maybe like not what it, or, oh, somebody was mean to me on Twitter. I mean, if that's the price, yeah, I have to, like that's a pretty easy price to pay. Yeah, I remember my uh, my big MSNBC <laughs> when I was on Melissa's show once. I made a joke about uh, you know that it's easier to be a white guy because uh, we were talking about like race issues, and I was like, for example, every time I come to MSNBC, I steal a mug, and everyone laughed, and I was like, ha ha ha. Then during the commercial break, a producer came over and he took my mug and he gave me a little plastic Dixie cup. And I go, what's this for? And he was like, you literally just admitted to stealing company property on NBC. I can't let you sit here with a mug. And I was like, oh, I get it. So like, I wasn't like dragged away and like lashed uh, right. for, you know, speaking out. Do you think that one of the most important things, I mean, this sounds like I'm just setting you up to promote your show. I am. Um, but what we saw this, and like, I'll, I, like I know you got to go, so I, I maybe come back on the show and we'll talk about Russian assets and all that stuff. But with everything we saw this week from NBC, your 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 former home, uh, pretty much like ignoring Bernie or you know saying how he did terribly in the debates to uh, Tulsi and even I saw even some celebrities calling uh, Andrew Yang you know, a Russian asset for defending Tulsi Gabbard. Um, how important is supporting independent media right now, whether you're a conservative or a liberal? Yeah, I mean, it's it's crucial that the mainstream media has become so sort of sanitized and such a monolith, um, the liberal media, that I think it's really crucial. And it's also really hard because, like, you know, you're if you're on YouTube, you're, like, at the mercy of the YouTube algorithm or, or whatever. So I think... Um, you know, directly supporting creators that you like and trust and respect, I think is absolutely critical. Cool. Well, look, you are the best. This was so like cathartic and, uh, and fun. Come back on literally anytime. Let's do it again. Thank All you so much. Thank you so much. See ya.